The Brigade of Guards Crimean War Memorial stands in Waterloo Place, at the junction of Regent Street and Pall Mall, a stone's throw from the Duke of York column. It is a monument steeped in history, and it was surprisingly rife with controversy when it was first unveiled in 1861. Some monuments stand to glory, or to fame, or to great accomplishments. This reminds one, however, of one of those great war memorials, or those to the Vietnam War in America, lamenting the loss rather than celebrating the victory. There is a unique depth of feeling to this monument, and it's quite reflective of the Victorian feeling about the Crimea, and in a great measure it's reflective of how we feel about the Crimean War today. It is one of my favourite monuments anywhere in the world, and well worth a visit to see in person. However, some of the Victorian criticism still stands. It is situated in the middle of the street, and as Punch remarked in 1861, no one goes there except on purpose. Owing to its unique positioning, all the audio was rather compromised, so you'll forgive the voiceover. The Crimean War was fought between 1853 and 1856 between the Russian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, later joined by the Allied forces of Great Britain and France in 1854, and in 1855 by the Kingdom of Sardinia Piedmont, which just five years later, with the aid of France, would become the Kingdom of Italy. The Allied coalition sought to prop up the Ottomans and prevent the Russians from taking large swathes of territory in the Balkans, the Caucasus, or Constantinople itself. Such a move would greatly upset the delicate balance of power in Europe and greatly add to the growing threat of the Russian Empire. In period, this war was referred to as the Russian War. Today we know it as the Crimean War, but it was far more than just the Crimean Theatre. The war had four main theatres. The Crimea, where it was intended to curtail the Russian naval threat against the Ottomans and deal a knockout blow to Russian ambitions in and beyond the Black Sea. The Balkans, which initially was a major theatre of the war, but in an infamous move thought to completely betray the Russians, the Austrian Empire threatened to intervene if the war proceeded further on the continent of Europe, and demanded the theatre be closed, lest war spread across the volatile Balkans and threatened to embroil the entire continent in war. The Caucasus, where historical divisions and unrest between Russians, Turks, Georgians, Abkhazians, Armenians, Azeris, and Circassians all were caught up in a series of campaigns back and forth across the Caucasian frontier. And the Baltic, wherein the combined British and French navies bottled up the Russian navy in the Baltic Sea and threatened the Russian capital at St. Petersburg, along with the Russian coastal defences in Finland and the Aland Islands. There were also minor actions in the Sea of Azov, the White Sea, Greece, and even a brief siege on the Pacific coast. The war was rife with problems. What was intended to be a swift move to deprive Russia of her main port on the Black Sea turned into a languorous campaign, and as with many large armies encamped for long periods of time, sickness spread, supplies were sparse, and tragic deaths from disease, hunger, and exposure were far more common than casualties in battle. Of the nearly 700,000 casualties of the combined armies of the Crimean War, a sizable percentage died from disease. Of the 40,462 British casualties in the war, 2,755 were killed in battle, 1,847 died of wounds, while 17,580 died from disease. There were political and organizational issues. Administrative duties were divided and nebulous at best. There were boards for this, boards for that. In fact, many of the military-related boards, including the very powerful Board of Ordnance, were reorganized as the War Department in 1855. Dickens immortalized this mid-Victorian frustration with boards, offices, and inefficient governance in his Circumlocution Office, featured in Little Dorrit, which was actually written around the time of the Crimean War and published in 1857. The war had horrible logistical issues, with supply shortages, mismanagement, and misallocation. There were bound to be problems projecting a force thousands of miles away, but in Britain's case, things were particularly shambolic and a huge embarrassment in front of their new French allies. Soldiers were issued green coffee beans without ample wood to roast coffee in the field. 
nor the grinders to grind the beans. Ships carrying vital winter clothing wrecked in storms. There were ammunition and food supply issues. Soldiers had to walk to Balaclava Harbor miles away to bring supplies back to their siege lines at Sebastopol. There were myriad problems, and these are just some of the examples. Near the onset of the war, the British army gathered in Malta, then was moved to Scutari on the Asian side of the Bosporus near Constantinople. Thence it was moved to Varna in modern-day Bulgaria, then to the Crimea. The army landed at Kalamata Bay, which lived up to its near namesake as a calamitous occasion. Once ashore, the army moved further south along the peninsula, the navy shadowing its movements. They moved across the river and stormed the heights at the Alma, and instead of pushing on to Sebastopol, the Allied armies maneuvered around and settled in for a protracted siege. The worst suffering of the war would occur in the trenches before Sebastopol. The other great battles of the war were all thwarting Russian counterattacks, Balaclava, Inkerman, and the Chennaiya. Balaclava saw the ill-fated charge of the Light Brigade, the details of which are still contested amongst historians today. The Light Cavalry Brigade charged a position with Russian artillery on three sides to prevent the Russians from capturing British guns. Regardless of who gave the order, the intention, and how it was carried out, it caused many to question communications, the purchasing of commissions, aristocratic officers, and the value placed on human life in the army. Furthermore, the motivation at home for the war was nebulous at best. Russophobia and the checking of Russian power, propping up the Ottoman Turks, working with their former enemies the French, who just had a Bonaparte return to power in Napoleon III and were beginning to build their own empire, the war was unpopular, but as with so many wars, there were impressive acts of valor, meritorious service, and there were great strides for reform resulting from those terrible mistakes. It was perseverance that stood out. Nonetheless, the war was a very present part of 1850s Britain. More than 100,000 Britons served in the war, not to mention the millions involved in related industries firearms, ammunition, food, clothing, etc. It was the first war to be widely photographed due to the work of Roger Fenton. And the war could be closely followed in the newspapers due to the work of such talents as William Howard Russell for the Times. There was extensive material culture to the war. There were trinkets and dishware. Soldiers came back with their medals, issued by both Britain and the Ottomans. Songs were written. Books and diaries were published, war trophies came home, most famously with scores of Russian cannons coming to Britain and Ireland, many of which are still fixtures of public parks today. And most importantly of all, the honored dead came home, and memorials were erected to their name. You can see in many churches memorials to fallen soldiers of the Crimea, all over Britain, and in fact all over Ireland as well. I was able to see at least 10 different memorials in Ireland last year, including this window in St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, which features the stained glass view of the siege lines at Sebastopol. In the late 1850s, this memorial to the Brigade of Guards would be commissioned, which would probably become the most famous Crimean War monument anywhere. The monument is specifically dedicated to the Brigade of Guards, which for this campaign was comprised of three battalions from the Guards regiments, 3rd Battalion Grenadier Guards, 1st Battalion of the Coldstream Guards, and 1st Battalion of the Scots Fusilier Guards. As an aside, it is customary for one battalion, or at least a few companies of a regiment, to remain at home while others are deployed abroad. This is why you may see in regimental histories that a regiment may have participated in two simultaneous campaigns, or quizzically is noted in two places at once. The Guards were among the most prestigious, best trained, and best equipped in the army. Soldiers of the Guards regiments wore their iconic bearskins, even in the hot Crimean sun, though they would also have their field caps to wear when not in full marching order as they are here. Line regiments wore the Albert Shaker, and likewise had their pillbox-shaped Kilmarnock caps for fatigue duties. They have their cap pouches, cartridge boxes, haversacks and water bottles, all worn over their greatcoats in cold weather. 
They carry the pattern 1851 Minet rifle musket. This was the musket that William Howard Russell, at the Battle of Inkerman, referred to as a destroying angel. It would vastly increase the capabilities and importance of the individual infantrymen and revolutionize warfare around the world. It was a profound example of mid-Victorian technology, and in the hands of trained soldiers, it would become a great and terrible arm of destruction. The monument itself is a granite block, with three guardsmen at the front. As with the Trafalgar Square lions and many monuments to British victories, the ironwork is cast from enemy cannons, these being cast from the Russian guns used in the siege of Sebastopol. The sculptor for these was John Bell. This is probably his most famous work, but he was also known for his sculpture America at the Prince Albert Memorial. On each side is a Scottish Taj, or shield, with the battles the Guards Brigade participated in, Alma, Inkerman, and Sebastopol. At the rear is a shield with crossed cannons, mortars, and laurels, with the inscription, To the memory of the 2,152 officers, non-commissioned officers, and privates of the Brigade of Guards who fell during the war with Russia in 1854-5-6, erected by their comrades. It was unveiled in 1861, and you can still see the year marked on the gas lamps around them today. In 1914, it was moved back to accommodate two new statues with reliefs along the base, and I think these two additions also speak to public opinion on the war, as they are two of the most prominent reforming figures who did much to ameliorate the great tragedy of war. Florence Nightingale, famous for her work organizing and reforming military medical care for the British Army in the Crimean War, notably establishing her hospital at Scutari outside Constantinople, and after the war, dedicating her life to reforming military medical care and public health care in general. One of the minor errors here is that she's depicted with this genie or Greek-style lamp. In period, she would have used a Turkish lantern, shaped much like an accordion. Here you can see her original Turkish lantern, or fanous, in the Florence Nightingale Museum in London. In period, she was affectionately referred to as Flo, a tradition that carries on to this day at the Florence Nightingale Museum. Flo was sculpted by Arthur George Walker, who again this is probably his most famous work, but he also sculpted many war memorials, including a number commemorating the fallen of the Great War. Opposite Flo is Sidney Herbert, the Secretary at War, who ran the War Office. He was one of the few top-level Crimean War leaders who came through the war with his reputation relatively unscathed. He fully supported Florence Nightingale and her work, and also sought to reform military education by establishing new schools, requirements, and the examination of officers, and was very influential in the reorganization of the War Department. Just after the war, we would see an end to the purchasing of commissions, and a marked reduction in the influence and involvement of underqualified people with the ability to buy their way into positions of power. Herbert's statue was sculpted by John Henry Foley, who famously sculpted the statue of Daniel O'Connell on O'Connell Street in Dublin, and the statue of Prince Albert, along with the allegorical sculptures representing Asia at the Prince Albert Memorial now in Kensington Gardens. Both statues' plinths are faced with reliefs depicting various scenes from hospitals, barracks, and factories, all essential in the British war machine. The period criticism of this memorial was brutal, bringing up many of the salient issues in the public feeling about the war, and I think some of them are worth hearing in their entirety. In the Illustrated London News, dated April of 1861, The Guards Memorial in Waterloo Place in giving and engraving of the Guards Memorial, recently erected at the bottom of Waterloo Place, we have to repeat our expression of regret that the public enthusiasm in honor of great and valorous deeds and the liberal contributions of the surviving members of the gallant corps should not have resulted in the production of a work more satisfactory as regards to its object and more creditable to the arts of the country. The Guards Memorial as it now stands before us must be confessed to be an eyesore, an obstruction of the public view of one of the most agreeable outlooks which our crowded thoroughfares afforded, and suggests the absolute necessity of some provision being made in this testimonial age to prevent our streets and squares being blocked up in all directions with unsightly effigies 
to departed worth, however honourable the sentiments which may lead to their construction. As a work of art, this memorial is almost beneath criticism. It may be said of it with perfect truth that it is unique. Nothing like it has ever been seen. Nothing else like it we trust will ever be seen. It is neither sculpturesque, nor architectural, nor jointly both. A heavy, irregular structure of granite is the principal object, filling up a considerable area in the roadway. Perched upon the upper portion of this structure stands a draped figure of honour, which, with wide extended hands, distributes coronals of laurel amongst three privates of the Brigade of Guards, who, equipped in full marching order, stand upon a shelf below at their back, and separating them from the rough granite, a trophy of colours, with the spear ends sticking above all. Independently of the hideousness of this granite pile, the arrangement of the figures outrages all accepted rules of artistic treatment. That of honour is the only one which can be seen from all sides, but from her attitude it is obvious that it is only intended to be viewed from the front. Its character and vocation being very problematical from all other parts, sometimes suggesting the idea to the irreverent multitude of a street acrobat throwing his four rings. The guardsman can only be seen from the front, and not the front facing the public thoroughfare, but that facing the vacant space between the Athenaeum and United Service Clubs, where no one goes except on purpose. No one will pretend that there is much at best in Mr. John Bell's idea of a group of honour in light flowing drapery, and three stalwart guardsmen in thick greatcoats, but if he had treated it in relief and thrown a little action into the latter figures, the absurdity and incongruity at present so conspicuous in the work might have been avoided, and the effect of the whole might have been still further heightened by inserting in other three faces of the granite structure, now so bare and unsightly, bas-reliefs commemorative of the days of Alma, Inkerman, and Sebastopol. As it is, the two side fronts have only those names inscribed upon them in hard square letters, while at the back, the upper granite block is adorned with a pile of cannon, arranged in a formal pyramidal order, beneath which is the following inscription, upon which, by a curious arrangement completing the wild disorder of the whole affair, honour turns its back. As with much in the Victorian era, Punch was rather more unreserved, and had a unique and scathing take on things. Rather than just attacking the style and placement, Punch continues to attack the conduct of the war and satirise the whole affair. They suggest the real monument should have our flow at the top, and acknowledge those killed by disease rather than just those killed in battle. Even in an era we often see as fusty and unsympathetic, no one could see past the real tragedies of the war. The Guards Monument As it is, and as it should be. Britannia is a liberal mistress to all who serve her. She is liberal in money, liberal in gratitude, liberal in honour, or at least if she isn't, it is not her fault. If her pay might be better, it isn't Britannia who is to blame, but her stewards, bailiffs, and foremen who manage the wages department. If her gratitude is sometimes grudging, it isn't Britannia who grudges it, but the clumsy or pampered menials whom she is obliged often to send out with messages and on errands to those who press their claims at her door. If the tributes of honour she bestows are too often ludicrous, petty, and disappointing to the people they are meant for, it is the fault of the contractors she employs to engage architects and sculptors, and not the old ladies who would prefer better workmen, if she knew how and where to find them. Unluckily, she wasn't brought up with special regard to accomplishments. And it must be confessed, if her contractors and master builders' taste be often at fault, her own would not be much better, if left to herself, but the old lady means well. It isn't always the sculptor's fault either, when the last new statue turns out to be a failure. Ten to one he has been crippled in means, or overruled in his design, or otherwise hindered in the development of his idea. But even if the statue be unobjectionable, Britannia is pretty sure to hear of some blunder in the inscription, which is always safe to sin in either bathos, bad grammar, brag, or balderdash. Take the last monument but one, erected out of Britannia's corpus, the Guards Memorial in Waterloo Place. It isn't what it should be in all points of design, less, however, by Mr. Bell's fault, than that of the committee which commissioned and overruled him. But the worst faults of the monument are not those of taste at all. However good its sculpture, the monument is a standing lie, as great a lie as the monument, if that columns like a tall bully lifts his head and lies on Fish Street Hill. 
the guard's memorial lifts its tall head and lies in Waterloo Place. The lie is not Mr. Bell's, who was told to celebrate death and victory, and has done it by his figure of honour crowning the brave trio, Fusiliers, Grenadiers and Coldstreams, with laurel wreaths. The inscription answers to and justifies Mr. Bell's design, but it is precisely in the inscription that the lie is to be found. Thus it runs Alma, Inkerman, Sebastopol, to the memory of the 2,152 officers and men of the Brigade of Guards who fell during the war with Russia, 1854, 1855, 1856. Fell, i.e. died in battle, or died of their wounds, died a soldier's death at the hands of the enemy. But what enemy? Do those who penned the inscription mean the Russians? By the list of battles it would seem so. But was Russia the enemy? Were Alma, Inkerman, and Sevastopol the battles in which 2,152 officers and privates of the guards fell in those years? Let us see the official returns. They tell us that the total number of the guards' brigade killed in the Crimean was at Alma, 37, at Inkerman, 120, before Sevastopol, 61, and that total number of died of their wounds was 161, making in all those who died in battle or wounds 449. What becomes of the remaining 1,713? Alas, they fell too, but in the combat with very different enemies. Their enemies were fever, dysentery, and cholera, who slew the first 376, the second 256, and the third with diarrhea 839, making the slain in these battles 1,471 and leaving 242 for the skirmishers with such formidable light troops as Frostbite, Scurvy, and their train. These are enemies who are occasionally let loose against us at home, but in the Crimea they were officered and manoeuvred by traitors from our own camp, general mismanagement, and general routine. It was these old villains who misdirected the stores and crippled the transport and prevented the roads from being made and shipped hospital stores under the shot and shell and ran riot in the Scutari hospitals and made the field hospitals scenes of misery and stench and starvation and putrefaction and sent out boys' boots and socks and flannels for big men to wear and served out green coffee with no mills to grind and no fuel to roast it and were at the bottom of a great many other of those master strokes of mischief which set Britannia asking whom she should hang, and left her very indignant she could not find the exact neck for the noose. No, the guard's monument is a mistake, to use the mildest term. The figures and inscription should both be altered without delay, for Mr. Bell's allegorical figure of honour, with her arms full of laurel wreaths, placed on the apex of the pyramid a statue of Florence Nightingale, with a bandage in one hand and a basin of broth in the other. Group three sick guardsmen below her, and for Alma, Inkerman, Sevastopol, inscribe fever, dysentery, cholera. And then the guards' memorial will speak the truth, for its inscription will commemorate the most deadly battles the English soldier in the Crimea had to fight, and its figures will represent his best aids when he conquered, or his best sources of comfort when he fell. Ultimately, the memorial stood the test of time, regardless of its historic criticism. Over the past century and a half, this monument has come to represent all the fallen of the Crimea, the work of medical pioneers and army reformers, and has come to enshrine the frustration with the Crimean War, and in a great measure, with war itself. So the next time you're in the area, stop by and go out of your way to make it over to the guards. While you're in the area, there are also a few interesting statues to see. Waterloo Place was created at the end of the 1820s as a final piece of the Triumphal Way that connects Regent's Park with Pall Mall. Construction of the Triumphal Way, which included Regent Street as its centerpiece, started in 1810 to a design by John Nash. The equestrian statue of King Edward VII. The most recent erection, the 2008 statue of Sir Keith Rodney Park, New Zealand-born First World War flying ace and commander responsible for the RAF's defense of London during the Battle of Britain. Antarctic explorer Robert Falcon Scott. Arctic explorer Sir John Franklin, captain of the Erebus, who died on the ice searching for the Northwest Passage, recently portrayed in the series The Terror. 
Lord John Lawrence, Ulster-born statesman who played a major role in the suppression of the Indian Rebellion and served as the Viceroy of India from 1864 to 1869. Sir Colin Campbell, later Field Marshal the Lord Clyde, famous for his defence against the Russian cavalry at Balaclava, which was immortalised as the Thin Red Line, and for his relief of the Siege of Lucknow. Sir John Burgoyne, Colonel Commandant of the Royal Engineers in Crimea, among other postings. And the Duke of York column, the Duke of York famously being the second son of George III, the Commander-in-Chief during the Napoleonic Wars, and a great army reformer, immortalised in the children's rhyme, where he marches his men up the hill and marches them down again. Well, thank you for listening to this treatise on the Guards Memorial and British military history in general. Let me know in the comments what you think about this memorial and what's your favorite memorial, Victorian or otherwise. And now I must sincerely thank Her Ladyship for facilitating this journey over to the Guards and for filming take after take in the middle of the street. A profound thank you to the Historical Gamer for reviewing the script and audio, to Patrick Krieger at the Krieger Cast for helping with the audio, script revisions, and editing, and to Rob at British Muzzleloaders for sending me on this quest. I had initially intended just to get some high definition footage of the Guards Memorial, but it turns out I had quite a bit more to say about it. And special thanks to Lieutenant General Phil Jones, late of the Royal Anglian Regiment, for his particular help. For more information on Florence Nightingale, the history of military medical care, and the heroic women of the war, including Mary Seacole, head over to at Florence Museum on Instagram. For more information on the history of the rifle musket, ammunition, and ordnance, check out Brett Gibbon's new book, The Destroying Angel, the rifle musket as the first modern infantry weapon. And The Destroying Angel is actually referencing that initial quote by William Howard Russell of the Battle of Inkerman. The link is in the profile, and for more experimental archaeology on rifle muskets and other 19th century firearms, check out Brett's channel, Paper Cartridges. As always, if you're looking for genteel Victorian goods and some interesting resources, go to lordrivers.com. And thank you again, and God save the Queen. Long may she reign.